Hello, connections. We I think we're back. Welcome to the 130 Eastern uh, category here. We're going to be talking about pedagogical aspects of wargaming with several of the premier wargame educators that are out there. Uh, we have Dr. James Starrett, who's Chief of Simulations and Education in the U.S. Army Command and General Staff College's Directorate of Simulation Education, where he has worked since 2004. Dr. Starrett teaches CGSC's courses on using games and simulations in training and education, and he runs the Wargame Design Focus Area in the Master's in Military Art and Science program. On the commercial side, his experience includes design work on the award-winning games Attack Vector Tactical from Ad Astra Games and Steel Beasts from eSim Games. His academic background includes a PhD in Soviet military history and several published articles on educational use of simulations. We also have Mr. Tim Smith, an SIA in analytic methodology and multi-warfare analysis, modeling and simulation in the Farragut Technical Analysis Center. Mr. Smith has worked in ONI since the mid-1980s, starting in current intelligence before moving on to serve with Naval Aviators in ONI's Air Warfare Division, SPEAR. Major career project consists of an in-depth study in the history and theory of intelligence failure and surprise, serving as ONI representative to national IC level boards concerned with analytic modernization. He leads the analytic reform within ONI designed to reduce the likelihood of strategic surprise, including the employment of MNS in the analysis of naval warfare capabilities. During 2011 and 12, he received an MSSI from the National Intelligence University. His thesis distilled the essence of the SIMBAT methodology and offers a vision for the IC's analytic future. Uh, he also runs the Annapolis Area Strategy Gaming Club, an academic enrichment program that teaches high schoolers history, planning, and decision making through board wargaming and supports adult historical wargaming programs, including validation testing of historical wargame designs for commercial vendors. We also have James Pigeon Fielder, an adjunct professor at CSU after retiring from the U.S. Air Force as a lieutenant colonel and associate professor of political science at the U.S. Air Force Academy. He's also serving as a Marine Corps University non-resident CRULAC fellow for academic year 2021 to 23, developing organizational war games under the name Liminal Operations and is a role-playing game content creator for Evil Beagle Games. Pigeon's research in interpersonal trust and emergent political processes through cyber-based interaction and through tabletop live action and digital gaming as natural experiments. He has over two decades of experience designing, executing, and assessing training exercises of war games from small group tabletop discussions to multi-day exercises engaging over 5,000 participants. He is a member of the Games Manufacturing Association, Manchester Game Studios Network, the Midwest Political Science Association, the Military Operations Research Society, the North American Simulation and Gaming Association, and Pi Sigma Alpha with peer reviewed, uh, as a peer review for the Journal of Information Technology and Politics, the Journal of Political Science Education, Media War and Conflict Simulation and Gaming and Social Movement Studies. And saving the best for last, Mr. Sebastian Bay, an adjunct professor at the Center for Security Studies at Georgetown University. He teaches a graduate course, Basic Support Gaming, where student teams research and design educational war games. He also serves as the faculty advisor to the Georgetown University War Gaming Society, who's the co-chair of the Military Operations Society, Moore's War Gaming Community of Practice, and a fellow at the Krulak Center for Innovation and Creativity. His professional work focuses on wargaming, emerging technologies, future warfaring concepts, and strategy and doctrine for the U.S. Army and Marine Corps. Previously served six years in Marine Corps infantry, leaving as a sergeant, a true working man. He deployed to Iraq in 2009 as a BA in Peace and Catholic Studies from UC Berkeley and a Master's in Security Studies from Georgetown University. I now will pass it over to Oh, uh, Mr. Lacey, who I left off of my... Little, I'll, I'll, I'll introduce myself. I'll let him introduce himself. <laughs> Sorry about that. Yeah, 
story of my life. <laughs> I'm up. All right. Hi. Many of you know me from a War on the Rocks article I wrote a few years back. I've got another one in progress on the continuing odyssey. Um, but uh, my, my uh, main purpose here is to just tell people what I do. Uh, I'm, if it, it's this title we have here, pedagogical, and, and then sometimes the word heuristic. Every time I hear those two words, I got to go look them up again because I can never remember what they mean. Uh, but I think it's best I'll just tell you what I do. I'm a, you know, I sometimes get annoyed that I get uh, I see letters published that all all Jim Lacy does is play war games, and they make up a very small part of my curriculum, but uh, what I consider the most important part of the curriculum. And then, uh, then we can discuss later during the question and answer period how much uh, um, how much of this is replicable in other institutions. Anyway, I'm not going to read my slides to you. I'll just throw them up there, and I'll let you all see them for yourselves. And uh, only talk at a few points on them. I am. I get emails back from students all the time, and I would say about a third of my student emails. Some of them dating back from students that came for the class almost a decade ago. Want to talk about the game that they played, and they're still worried about their moves and what they could have done better. Absolutely incredible. Um, I had, I got called in the carpet once in a hallway by a senior um, education representative for the Marine Corps. He said, "You think this game and works?" And one of my students from two years ago walked by and said hello, and I called him over. And I said to him, hey, did you, when we played Polis, which is the game in front of you, actually we played Pericles at the time, did you um, go for Syracuse? And he said, yes. I said, why? Everyone knows going for Syracuse is a dumb move. Uh, you know, Thucydides, if you only learn one thing about Thucydides, it's don't go to Syracuse. And then he listed about 10 reasons why he did it. The wheat was there, captured their fleet. He had good strategic reasons. And I said, now go, I talked to the other guy, I said, now go to any other war college student from two years ago and say, what did you learn about the strategic implications that were outlined at Thucydides? And all you're going to get is a blank stare. They remember the game. They do not remember the lecture. Uh, last point here. We're always told to give our students something to think about, critical thinking. Um, Wargaming does it. Every single term presents a new operational or strategic look, puzzle for them to solve. And look at that picture there. That was not a posed picture. That is a typical picture. I don't get that kind of buy-in. When they're looking at a game, they're all in. They're studying it. They're talking about it. They're thinking strategy. When I'm lecturing, I'm, I, I, I'm competing with their laptops. Uh, th this, is, this is where you go to get buy-in on everything. All right. I don't just do wargaming, and wargaming by itself fails. So my students, before they play a war game, have listened to audio tapes on the topic we're discussing. They have done readings. They have gotten lectures, discussion, seminars, when possible, a staff ride. Why listen to Jim Lacey on the Peloponnesian War if uh, – Rob, if Kagan and uh, Paul Ray and uh, and um, Victor Davis Hanson had videos out there explaining the war, why not hear it from the best? And then after all that is done, we do the war games. They don't stand in isolation. They don't work in isolation, but they lock in all the other lessons. So in, for instance, World War II, they get their assigned readings and they have to watch the videos from some of the great World War II historians out there. Then we have a series of lectures on geopolitical concepts, innovation between the wars, uh, European strategy, Pacific strategy, strategic issues. Then I run a Casablanca simulation where I put them all in the roles of the generals at Casablanca. I use the actual staff studies and say, all right, think, think of what you want to do for the next two years of the war. See how close you come to what the original decision was. And then we played a war game. We don't have a staff ride for the European one we used to, but I'm, I'm trying to get it back. But my, I'm just reiterating here, war games in isolation are useless. And I, I can't tell you how many other professors have written in War on the Rocks and all sorts of other places that 
don't pay any attention to Lacey because that's all he does is war gaming. Now, war gaming is the capstone of a much deeper and much more integrated program. And that is the only way it works. I also use war gaming when I was given seminars and lectures. The, uh, I, we don't have to play a game. I can, war gaming maps are just super. So here's a, just one slide from a lecture I give on World War II where I just lit, put the economics out, the diplomacy sections, what, what matters during the war. And the students are able to trace this to a great degree. I do the same thing. I use Empire of the Sun. This first one, obviously, is for those not is Unconditional Surrender, great map to study World War II with. And uh, Empire of the Sun is, is the background slide for everything I talk about on the Pacific. Um, it, it, it just gives you a new way of teaching when you're lecturing or conducting a seminar where they can see all of the important military items in one spot. Number, I just here's a list of the games we employ in in just the war college, and this is just my section of the war college. Other the other departments use practical exercises in war games to a degree. Nothing's matching mine. Um, teach Thucydides, teach Civil War, teach World War One, and then there's the games I teach World War II. I'm the current guy. I'm the history guy. I have moved into the current world. Uh, the um, because it was vacant, and for that we use a matrix games. Rand's Hedgebony worked very well this year. That's actually run by a joint warfare section. Uh, Sebastian Bay has talked more about that and knows more about it than I do. This year we did a one-week global war game uh, using Assassin's Mace and Zopid. They'll be, hopefully after I get clearance. Uh, some of our findings may, we may have stumbled into the classified realm when you put it all together. There'll be a write-up about that. We did a war game competition with all the MCU schools this year. And next year, I'm adding a war games based enrichment programs for all the schools. So we got a pretty robust program here at the Marine Corps War College, both historical and future. And I'm also adding a in-depth study using Assassin's Mason's iPod with select students this year to look at specific problems, which will run all year as an extracurricular activity. And I love playing diplomacy with the students. I keep thinking that the students are going to hate diplomacy, um, but the results are always overwhelming on the critiques. This is one of the best games they ever played for learning negotiating skills or how to negotiate in an environment where you can't trust anyone. This is uh, what my students will do all year. The picture there is from our, our three-day exercise. And you can see uh, Zapid tactical map, the Balkans off to the left. You, there's the strategic map. And on the far side is the strategic and the tactical maps for Taiwan. Once again, look at that map on the Taiwan left-hand side there. My arrow is, if you can see it. Um, that's that's just amazing buy-in. And I'll let you read the uh, thing. We may not develop the next war plan orange, but you know, we're gonna make a shot at it. I also run a 2025 exercise where I just use piece pieces from next war, put them over a Google Maps, and then I have a series of events that take place. Um, and the students go off after each event and just do a decision exercise and come back. It's not true war gaming, but it is the use of war games to do other things. And you can even try and make it historically based. If you look at that bend in the river and I have the Russians moving from the Crimea up here in the north, which you can't see on this picture, uh, this is an exact replica in the modern day of the Battle of Chancellorsville. So if I'm going to do a Chancellorsville staff st staff ride, and I want to lock it to the present day, there's no better tool than just to put your put war gaming pieces on a current map and say, how would you fight that battle today? And we all year, all second semester, with uh, with James Starrett's help, uh, we we ran a assessment. I just got tired of reading. Uh, 
student papers. So I said, you're going to play a war game all year. What you're going to do is each week or two weeks um, say, here's my plan. Here's what I want to do. War gamers played that out on a Saturday or a Sunday. And then we had a new thing and they went off and planned it again. That worked out so well that I'm going to do it both semesters this year. And I hope not to read any student papers for the entire year. Um, I'm going to do an historical game, probably Fortress Europa. James, I hope you're in for this on uh, for, that, for the first semester, and then a modern NATO NATO game for the second semester. So it just doesn't have to be a game that you you set up and play one day. With a little help, you can you can extend these things out over months and weeks. The critiques on this were wonderful. The students, even in my hallway discussion, said, "Oh, we just love sitting around." talking about how we're going to fight, what we're going to fight. That's what they expected the war college um, experience to be about, how to fight wars, how to think about wars. Um, this gives them a way to do it on a regular basis, even when you're not wargaming in the classroom. And that's it. I think I did my uh, under 10 minutes as promised. And um, Excellent. Thank you, Jim. Thank you. We'll move on now to uh, Pigeon. All right. So I don't have any slides. I'm going full command today. Just going to talk, um, not most, not totally off the cuff. I do have uh, notes here for myself, uh, thinking about um, how do I bridge the gap between both experience in uniform uh, teaching at the Air Force Academy, I guess you could say entry level political, um, um, professional military education, excuse me, and then moving over to CSU, where I'm doing, you know, teaching civilian education, and there are uh, fairly significant differences. Uh, starting at the Air Force Academy, where I uh, rarely had a course with more than 25 students assigned to it. Now I come to CSU, and I have sections that have 150 students each. So how I use games in the classroom is going to vary, both on what I'm trying to teach and then the size of the group I'm working with. So. Uh, it, I guess take these notes both in terms of how it applies to PME, but also if you're doing military training with a large group, like planning for an entire company, some of the, some of the tools I use for a large section class, uh, classroom might help you as well for uh, just large scale training, if you will. So for me, it always starts with the objective. In this case, it's the educational objective. What is it that I'm trying to do what am I trying to teach or make sure is being reinforced with my students? Either it's my uh, Air Force Academy cadets or in a um, geopolitics class, or it's my CSU students in comparative authoritarian class. If I don't match the game to objective, they might be having fun, but it's not an educational game then. I'm not, it's basically I'm wasting my time and I'm wasting um, their time. Now, if it's a manual game, I'm going to think about it a little differently. So, for example, two years ago when I taught uh, my first course at CSU, Comparative Authoritarianism, there was only 40 students. So I thought, you know, I can very easily deploy a manual uh, game in this classroom. I can divide the group into teams. We can have one large map. I can project stuff on a screen. And sticking with James Dunnigan's uh, old advice, keep it simple and plagiarize, rather than building from the ground up, I thought, if my objective is to measure how well students understand different authoritarian government styles, then I'm going to work backwards and find games that I think have mechanics that will support that. And I wanted to be semi-cooperative as well. Largely, the I wanted my student teams to be fighting the game, not each other, although there were some elements of conflict between teams. I taught the same advice to my um course at the Air Force Academy, I did teach the, the war game design course uh, one semester, which was a lot of fun. And I told them, you know, working with a client, they're going to ask you to build a game. Try never to have build just a bespoke game from the ground up. Think back from your client's objective, work backwards. What mechanics can I use to build this? Um, sticking with this example for a second before I go back to CSU. So at the war game design course, two, two groups of students working for real customers, one working for US Stratcom, one working for the NRO. So I'll stick with the, uh, the NRO team. They thought the objective is, is to build a budget for the US Space Force for 50 years. 
So they thought, okay, if the budget is gonna be based around threats, so we want to have games that have some sort of threat mechanic that's carried over time. And we want different layers in the bureaucracy. So they took elements of the Grizzled, which is a card game, Castle Panic, which is kind of an abstract fantasy game, and um, um, Captain Sonar, which has uh, dual levels of cooperation and put those together to make a game for the NRO and it worked very well. So anyway, going back to CSU, it also worked very well. I mean, I would say from a manual perspective, it maybe takes a little bit longer to uh, gather uh, data from a manual game because it's mostly like interviews or making sure I'm taking photographs of the stages of play and whatnot. And then grading students based on an after action paper though, not based on um, their actual performance during the game. Now, what raises stakes though is that I moved to a section of 150 students. So I'm like, I don't have, at least I'm not aware of facilities where I can move all these students in one place to have all these different boards that I'm trying to supervise. And I probably don't have many students who have the, the technical know-how to support me as, um, uh, white cell, if you will, you know, working very intently with other teams. So then I transitioned to software. And then again, working for the objective, what's the easiest way I can meet the intent of the class, you know, without getting very complex. And I became theater of the mind as opposed to a board game or a card game. It was all done on Discord, Zoom, and Google Docs. And it was all, it was more like a, a message traffic game. I was playing the Overlord, it was a zombie apocalypse game and I'm just putting out traffic and all the teams are reading the traffic and they have their own channels in discord. And I did have some students and my teaching assistants go out to help. Um, but it was largely me as a spider in the center of the web and just making up as I get, uh, went along based on um, student uh, mm -hmm. actions. What makes that problematic though, is how do I bottle that for someone else? Like I know how to do that but I've had problems in the past when it comes to software games or for training purposes that they end up being bespoke. Like it's very, something that's designed specifically for this PME program that the students had to learn how to use and they never see it again for the rest of their career. So what can I do that I could teach someone this method either manually or have a, a software solution for education that anyone could adopt and they can understand? Um, so in order, I'm not a huge fan of bespoke, even though I find myself stuck, you know, making these theater of the mind games that I can't really have someone else replicate commercial off the shelf software or hardware. Um, that would be James Lacey having these manual board games like everyone. Okay. I can recognize this. I can read the rules. I can make some slight modifications. And then uh, finally my dream for a professional military education in software form is to actually have something built into systems that people already use that is then replicated as a part of the software package all over the DOD. So anyone can play this game in any shop, if you, if, if you will. Um, something like, um, um, see, I've been out of the Air Force for two years now and I already can't remember this, the, the acronym for it. Okay, I'll just say, so I don't use it too much time. Um, there's a basically a software tool that the Air Force uses for intelligence analysis and production. And like build the game inside of that tool because it's now you don't have to teach the students how to use it. They know how to use this. And now the AI inside of it creates scenarios or an overworld can create scenarios using the same system they already use. That way they're learning and they're becoming more proficient at the system as well at the same time. So with that, that's basically my um, magnum opus in a nutshell. But I'm looking for your questions, comments, and threats at the end of the course. Excellent. Thank you. We'll now move on to Sebastian. Yeah, so I will be brief uh, because I really want to get at questions and discussions. So I teach a wargaming design course. So my course is really designed and aimed at producing new wargame designers. But at, admittedly, uh, about only a quarter, if that, uh, at any given time, I'll go on to do more wargaming after my class. The majority of them will go back to the military. They will be analysts in other fields or go on to other career fields. For those uh, that do not become full-time designers like myself, uh, the hope is that they add wargaming um, 
to their analytical toolbox and the, to their critical thinking skills. But more than anything, they build our wargaming literacy, right? So the next time they are FSO and they encounter our game, uh, they're able to understand why and how they're supposed to play, right? And the value and utility of games and what they can and cannot do. I think that's very important. So if there is a, a magnum opus for my class uh, at U.S. Naval Academy and at Georgetown and Command and Staff, it is the notion that if you produce more designers, they produce more educational games, and that will allow um, PME and civilian education to have more games that are tailored to them, right? Um, one of the hard, you know, uh, or the the short uh, poles of the tent in our uh, educational PME use of wargaming is the fact that there's not enough time for all the designers and not enough designers to go around to support all the classes that we have. Uh, so my hope is to uh, change that equation and increase the supply, but also increase literacy of why games are important and what they can and cannot do in the classroom and beyond it. Um, so I'll hand it over to the next person. Excellent, thank you. Mr. James Starrett is up next. I don't know that I can be as concise as Sebastian was, but uh, preach on, Brother Bay. <clears throat> so what I was going to look at is a case study of a class that I teach on teaching military history using games. And we teach this as a joint thing with the Department of Military History. I started teaching it with Greg Hospador, but he moved off, and now I teach it with Jonathan Abel. So our brief is to teach military history, and in a sense, secretly, this is intended to be a lab in which we can try out doing as maximally wargaming-driven a course as possible. And to spall off Jim Lacey, you will notice that even in this class where we are free to do pretty much whatever we want, the game can't stand by itself. So I'm going to talk a little bit of theory, and then I'll go into structure practice and lessons learned along the way. Fundamentally, we're trying to teach history through experiential education, through experiential learning. The class flips between experimentation and concrete experience with the game and the reflection and abstract conceptualization stage as you are doing the discussion and some written feedback they've got to provide. And then we repeat and repeat and repeat. Less formally, we're playing the game so that they walk 10 feet in their counterpart's socks. We're very actively aware of the limitations of, of any of the games we're going to use. They're going to learn about the history by experiencing the model's representation, and then they're going to discuss and reflect upon what they experienced and the reading they did in order to come to a better understanding. Then there's variety across the course so that they get to compare how warfare was conducted in various ways across the different eras. The structure of the class really matters. Most of us cannot control the structure we are working in. We've got eight three-hour classes for this. That's actually in some ways really nice because three hours is a good amount of time. More would be better. I'll go into that in a minute. I've also taught game-driven courses in a 12-session by two-hour format, which is tends to be a sprint when you're running them. And I've supported one-hour classes, which uh, needs extraordinarily careful game selection. You've got to have something that's very short and very elegant to fit into a, a one-hour class. More time is not always better, but you have to make sure that you put in enough time to get to the goals of running the game, which includes learning the game well enough to get to whatever those goals may be. A frequent struggle in other courses is trying to convince instructors that it's not just the time to play the game and the time to discuss the game, but maybe a trial run first if you care about them playing it well before they discuss. The structure of our class, and beginning slightly oddly at the beginning, sorry, at the end of a class, the last five, 10 minutes of a class is always a quickie overview of the game for the next class, which we found supercharges their ability to not only get something out of reading the rules and watching the videos on the game, which is part of their homework, but it also means that in turn, they've got a better clue when we teach it formally at the beginning of the next class. As homework, they've also got a little bit of reading on the topic and an AAR sheet to write out, and we will get back to that AAR sheet. So we start the class with a tutorial in the game. The depth and length and method of that tutorial varies. Some really complex games, such as Nevsky and Triumph and Tragedy, we've learned to teach fastest by lockstepping them through the first full turn. We tell them, you're going to do this, you're going to do this, here is the plan we're going to execute, because that way they can see everything fall into place, and then we release the handcuffs and let them do as they will after that. We typically play until there's around ish 45 minutes left in the class, at which point we go to an immediate AR and discussion of the history. 
the fact that you've got two history PhDs running the class really kind of helps in this because between John and me, we can cover most anything that we need to. We always have some themes that we want to bring up, but we try to be largely driven by student questions and comments. We let their reflection drive that discussion and sort of see where it goes. And we'll follow along and help them out. We also wind up frequently reminding them that all the models are wrong and that they should not only be drawing lessons from the games, but they should be recognizing the places that the game falls short. What didn't it show? What couldn't it show? Why didn't it show that? Because that helps them understand the, the boundaries of what they've learned. After each class, they have to write a AAR, it's, it's written up on Blackboard, which is several short answer open paragraph essays on each game, which really is focused on a couple of questions of what did you learn about the history? What did you learn from the games? What did you learn about the principles of war? And how can you apl apply this professionally in the future? A note on running the games, I see no need to finish the game. We're not always necessarily even specifically interested in the battle itself. For example, we run Napoleon 1807. We don't. We run it for the Eilau scenario. We don't actually care about Eilau. We cover care about maneuver in the Napoleonic era at the operational level. So we break the scenario in a sense by saying, guess what? There's only going to be one rain event per game because it doesn't matter to us that we get the weather correct for the Eilau scenario. From my perspective, if they turn the corner from fighting the game system to fighting each other, they've probably got 80% of the learning they're going to get from the game about the history because they now understand the model and fundamentally experiencing the models where they're going to learn. The students always want to play the games twice. They want to play the games longer and that's great. They're engaged, but it's kind of tough for them and you need to not listen sometimes to their, their complaints. Where possible, we will put two students in each player role. This means that they've got a battle buddy. So the things that they didn't understand about the game, they've got somebody to talk with. They've got somebody to discuss their plans with. And sneakily, while they're discussing their plans, we, the instructors, can be listening in in order to have material for the discussion later. On game selection, first, I am absolutely 1,000% agreed with Pigeon. You need to choose games that fit the objective. If you don't, as Pigeon said, you're wasting people's time. We have four initial screening criteria for games for this class. We have to think they're good games. They have to be available for our use. If I can't get enough copies of it, it's pointless. They have to be teachable and executable to the necessary extent in the time we have available. And they have to be absolutely dripping with relevant historical detail, stuff we can use to drive the discussion on what is special about this era. Uh, I've had people suggest, for example, I had one person suggest to me that we should use a miniatures game for all of warfare since the first thrown rock until the advent of gunpowder. And my question back was, how can I tell the difference between a Macedonian phalanx and a Roman legion? And the answer was, well, you can't. And I said, well, it doesn't actually help us then because it doesn't drive the learning that we need. Selection of those games is a brutal cage match. Two games enter, one game leaves. There's eight slots and they really have got to fight for that. I like to have thematic cross-references cross between them so that they can see how operations or logistics or strategy evolved over time. It's also neat to have comparisons of unit and map scales. One of the things we found is neat is that we always begin with Battle for Moscow because it's a great introductory war game. We often include Drive on Paris, a uh, standard combat series game on the opening moves of 1914 in the West. And it's always entertaining to watch students' faces when we point out to them that the maps carry, cover the same area of ground. So there's a lot of sequencing in choosing the games, choosing them in part to balance themes versus chronology versus necessary complexity and working through that. Next note, this is manpower intensive. We have two instructors. I usually have one or more assistants. I like to have one assistant per table. Jim Lacey is able to get in volunteers. I have other people on my team. Preparation is time intensive. Prepping a new game for this course usually means at a minimum, several days of teaching prep in which we figure out how to teach it, murder board the teaching script, practice it, and make sure that the assistants are fully qualified to run the game. Fortunately, however, on the good side, students love the class. Admittedly, they are self-selected, so maybe there's less surprise there. But equally, both the AAR sheets and the things they exclaim to us in class, sometimes during the game, demonstrate that they're really, in fact, learning things about history. They often, well, they often come up with things that tell us, well, you really got that. Uh, the, our favorite is that at one point we were running 
a Napoleonic game and one of the students burst out, I have been reading a book on the Waterloo campaign all year. And now I understand what this is all about. I understand Napoleonic maneuver. Thank you. On to the next person. Thank you very much. So now we'll go on to Mr. Tim Smith. Hi, Tim Smith, Office of Naval Intelligence. So this is the ONI simulation-based analysis and training program, the training component thereof. And you'll see uh, a selection of uh, games that we have made down to, at least for our junior trainees, which uh, center on access and allies. There are many different uh, relatively simple games that offer significant uh, learning value. We have done some other higher level games for a training in a wide variety of courses. There's a game here from uh, Decision Games on, on the site of the Garvin, which uh, was uh, a major event early in the First World War uh, with some uh, the unit counters that we uh, folded in from another gaming system. And in the lower right, you can see uh, a battle of Midway that we ran. Uh, of the lower left, you'll see some of the uh, structured analytic templates or decision support matrices that we use to help the students perform analyses. This is the our events. Um, the advantage of being a training program is that first, we have the facility that they give us, which is sometimes rather ad hoc, for the entire period of the training course. This was a one week course. So the game can be large and it can stay up so that we can get iterative analysis and go to some depth uh, in the game. And uh, so that is one uh, strong advantage. I, I often uh, put up this slide. This was one of my sales pitch slides early in the program. Down at the bottom, you'll see, ah, uh, not quite. Uh, in fact, one of the problems with uh, Navy wargaming in the 1930s was that they did not really have that Clausewitzian uh, active, willful adversary uh, playing for uh, intelligence, and they did not really get as dynamic an adversary as they should have. Even in the Pacific, we had difficulties. We certainly failed to foresee the U-boats, and we failed to understand uh, Japanese torpedo-driven surface warfare night tactics, and it took us a long time to respond. So the overall SIMBAT program is designed to fulfill larger organizational objectives. It's really not training for analysts so much as it is kind of a building a knowledge base across the organization as a whole, um, as well as to support uh, retention and, and advancing the state of analytic methodology so we have a lot more uh, conceptual reasoning uh, rather than fact-driven uh, analyses uh, in our reporting. So we don't have much time. So basically it is to promote uh, analytic culture change more toward understanding warfare in its breadth and depth, cause and effect, and uh, uh, the ability to model it um, quantitatively and logically so that you can understand it in that kind of architectural way. And what we built here is this program is kind of a uh, cross between two domains of methodology. DOE is typically uh, heavy in modeling and simulation. Uh, Wargaming has been a big part of it, but uh, it's heavy on the quantitative methods, whereas the intelligence community has always been qualitative in its method and uh, somewhat intuitive and subjective uh, and not very rigorously capable of plotting through alternative adversary colors, courses of action, to make good estimates of uh, future threat uh, contingencies. So this is to, try to try to drive that and to, to wed the two different uh, ways of thinking, kind of left brain, right brain marriage. Paradigm complementarity is, is what I like to call it. Um, so it's both that IC analytic trade craft, which really is a trade craft, and DOD analytic methodology, which of course is informed by operations research campaign analysis and so on and so forth, as well as the war gaming that I've uh, shared uh, here in ONI. And the whole thing has a, a, a spiral to it uh, to build uh, the uh, totality of the product because it's really a comprehensive uh, total product outcome. It's not just the drill down analysis of the models that we're looking for. There are some of the other simulations that we use just, just to show you kind of a visual look and feel for the thing. You see it's not different from what uh, the uh, uh, Jim Lacey and James Starrett have done. Uh, the course structure, typically three to five days in duration. 
We'll start out with three things of warfare in the era in question, because usually we're using history because we want to give them that background knowledge that most of our junior uh, civilians do not really have. Uh, so we start with briefings. Then we run them through analysis and staff exercises built pretty much on the military staff model with the kinds of structured analytic templates and decision support matrices, synchronization matrices that are done in the military decision making process. So we execute the simulation and we do the after action review. Uh, like James uh, emphasized, we don't generally drive to a conclusion. Sometimes the war ends sooner than we expected. But it's not a bad idea uh, to uh, stop before there's a defined winner and loser, because that still keeps the analytic juices flowing rather than uh, blame hurling and, and disappointment that can disrupt some of the objectivity required for doing a really good AAR and having good memorable takeaways. So we follow the Naval War College uh, format, uh, red, blue, and white. Uh, for larger courses, I'll have a small group of white cell colleagues with me. We actually have them with the fire cells, the red and blue cell, if you will. Uh, and we call them white cell embeds because we don't have time in a training model to teach the students the war game uh, in advance. They don't read the rules. We give them the war game ad hoc and we have them kind of learn through doing. We explain it as we go very, very rapidly. So that's another reason for choosing a relatively simple game. But Having the lab and being able to keep the games up and running them for five, four or five, eight hour sessions, we can really do some pretty in-depth analysis into the causal factors and the numbers in the models. So uh, commercial hobby war games, I've mentioned that. I don't want to take up too much time. This is a classic one. There are a lot of variations of Access and Allies that come out. And one of the things that Access and Allies does, it requires you to design your own force structure. Um, each of responsibility of the Office of Naval Intelligence is supporting acquisition. So we need to have our students understand what drives the acquisition community and the force of structure design uh, decision making in the E-ring uh, at the OSD, uh, JS, uh, JCS level and the, uh, the N8 uh, decision makers. And so we train with that. This uh, illustrates some of the uh, uh, matrices that we use so that they can understand the quantitative schema in the model. We want them to understand the numbers, to crunch the numbers, so that they can make informed, uh, rational actor decisions in their color selection and in their execution. And we do that through this staff exercise that is basically the, your classic MDNP. We look at uh, uh, principles of war. We want them to understand critical factors analysis. We want them to understand centers of gravity and key vulnerabilities. And then so we run them through some simple uh, checklists and uh, uh, just to make them think concretely and critically about the factors in the model of the war game and how to incorporate them uh, into their color decision and plan. So these are the kind of structured exercises we have them engage in. It's really quite new to most of these non-prior service civilians that were hiring, particularly in this ever more youthful uh, a diverse um, demographic era. So this helps them uh, take cogn hard cognitive takeaways that they can uh, code into their memory. And the uh, after action review is, is absolutely critical. The war game is a whirlwind of impressions, of emotions, which is one of the critical reasons why they tend to remember these experiences so long. We have to slow them down and have them sort through what they did and why they did it in the after action review. So largely, we will facilitate the students explain what they did and why, and they can exchange from the red and the blue cells to uh, say, oh, you did that, I'm surprised by that. So that is the, uh, the, the basic overview, and I think that leaves us a little bit of time for Q&A. Indeed it does. The first question coming up is for Mr. Lacey. On the list, you've got some commercially available games that you put in. Uh, what are your decision criteria for selecting? Are they pedagogical or what other? Obviously, simplicity, I know, is one of them. Um, it's a con constant uh, analysis. New games come out. They get play tested by some of, some of the local gamers. 
They've got to teach the historical lessons that I want to teach in the class, or if it's for future related, they've got to have enough realism that students can actually um, analyze what's going to, what potential future scenarios. Uh, there's got, they, they've got to be relatively simple to play, but as somebody uh, said, I do bring in professional gamers to sit there and help them with the mechanics so the students can focus on the strategy. Um, uh, and that's about it. Simple to play, and they uh, they meet my requirements for reinforcing the learning that's already been done. Excellent. For the group, how would you introduce wargaming outside the military? If wargaming is not enough, would the same approach you're taking with the military also work for non-military uh, audiences that are still mission oriented? Is that a DOD oriented question or is that um, a university or otherwise oriented question in the civilian realm? So I'll jump on that question. So I think regardless of whether it's DOD or USAID or State Department, um, I've always found it to always be useful to present a problem that they are uh, interested in. Uh, like, you know, I, mean, I always say provide red meat to the carn carnivores uh, and what that red meat may change depending on your audience, right? If you're doing a bunch of Russia experts, so like give them something about Crimea, like they can never resist it, right? Um, uh, and so forth, right? So find out the problem that they're itching to tackle, uh, make that into a game or have a, a modified game or leverage a game that presents that kind of problem and they'll come hungry, right? And they'll be interested in it. So uh, I always say provide the red meat to the carnivores. One thing to add on there, <clears throat> we often have the CGSC Foundation bring in external groups and what, we, what it is that we run for them depends on the group and it also depends on the time and what it is they're wanting to do exactly as Sebastian's suggesting. So often they want something that is sort of business strategy-ish and we will run them through quartermaster general in the framework of teaching them the ends, ways, means framework for analyzing strategy. We also, most years we get in a group of local teachers, high school and uh, and lower teachers, high school and further down teachers. Uh, and often with them, we've got less time, but we'll be talking about how to use games in education anyway, and we will play Hanabi, which isn't a war game, but we'll play that with them and talk about, hey, look at how this drives as a sample lesson, all of the various eight elements of critical thought. And for me, um... I have the dual challenge of um, making the appeal to fellow civilian academics, like kind of like being the local CSU evangelist for games in the classroom. You know, some professors really, really enjoy it and they've used it before and others are skeptical. And also since I consult uh, companies and other organizations, um, I'll, here's an example. I gave a, I was in a pitch competition a year ago for my consultancy and half the judges who had seen corporate war games before were like, yes, this looks awesome. And the half that had never done it before, they looked at me like I was scoring horns in my head. And they said, you mean like like you play Monopoly or something like that? I'm like, uh, first, Monopoly is a terrible game. You just need to roll a seven consistently. And second, no, it's totally different than that. So I had to like um, do a little bit more convincing. Plus, I've also found on the civilian side that some organizations uh, balk at the use of war game. So if they use like um, immersive exercise or training exercise or something that doesn't have the word war in it. I'll just throw in from my experience that when you start with something that the non-war gamers are familiar with and sort of lead them to want the increase in our activity. So if you start with like a yellow sticky bog sat and then add some game-like elements to it, I found that worked pretty well in getting people who were those horns, <laughs> looking at me like I had horns growing out to, to, to sort of set them up to mm -hmm. see the limitations in what they've been doing and then see how the gaming elements uh, address that. To the next question, how do you update your game lists? And do you have a favorite that has a fixed position on your list? That... 
Uh, I will be the first one to admit that Frederick uh, by um, Rio Grande Games, and I forget what the German company is, um, but I love that game. I have that on my list all the time, mainly because it's uh, simple. It's an elegant rule set. Uh, I love the design. It's one of those designs that I wish I designed and has uh, tremendous value um, teaching logistics and uh, strategic thinking uh, across multiple theaters. And it's a very interesting problem set. Uh, so I always have that on my list. Um, and I'm not as constrained as some of the other people on this fo on this panel because I don't actually teach like a history or military strategy course. I teach a design course, uh, so I have a little more liberty than others. Probably the game at CGSC that we use more than any other is the the newer, the updated version of Frank Chadwick's Battle for Moscow. The updated version you can get for free from C3i Magazine is a print and play. If you search for Overlabs, you can play it online. It is a brilliant job of an introductory war game, and we use it that for that again and again and again. So if we had to name one favorite, that would be it. In terms of selection, it's always a brutal match in which it goes back to all the stuff that Pigeon was bringing up. The game has to be... You have to identify what it is the course needs to do. The game has to be able to do that. It has to answer the mail for the course, or it goes out. Yeah, I, I would add that the main requirement is simply to be a very uh, active uh, observer of uh, the war game hobby and industry, because there's just a lot of content that has been produced and a lot of it that is being produced. And it's very, very important to choose that uh, right proper game that you can adapt to your learning objectives um, or your whatever your mission objectives are. Um, it just takes a tremendous amount of exploration of, of uh, various different games that have been published. Do you get into student design games? Do you have games that your students uh, design as part of any of your curricula? I'll go on that because I have, like Sebastian, I've got students who design games. The answer normally is no, because the student games in the time that they've got are not sufficiently polished. They just don't have the opportunity to do it. However, an exception to that is that at the, as the final project in one of the other courses I teach, students have to do a briefing on, hey, I'm going to teach these people this thing using this game, and here's the logic. And what I care about is that they can clearly articulate why it's the right choice. And these students said, hey, we're going to use Race to the Rhine in a Kriegspiel manner with multiple boards and all across. And Mike Dunn and I looked at each other and said, that is too cool not to do. So we wound up running that the uh, Friday before Memorial Day with the students. That sounds awesome. Uh, here's a question dealing with academic underpinnings of war game based military history. This sounds like it's aimed at you, uh, Dr. Lacey. Uh, what uh, what type of uh, research is there that shows that this is more effective than other uh, types? Um, every year I get three or four people who come to me and say, can I come watch your games because I want to start a PhD to determine how effective wargaming is in learning. And... I was very enthused the first time this happened to me, the second time and the third time. And then I finally said, I, can I advise you to find a new topic before you go f too far down this line? Because the the evidence in the, in the literature isn't there. It, there's plenty of evidence for serious gaming, but for war gaming and history and its impact, I said, it's almost, it's very difficult to measure. They persist. They all come to a bunch of games, and then about after six months to a year, they say, boy, this is a terrible topic. I'm switching because they can't prove it. Um, what I can say is that I have taught the Civil War um, or the July Crisis. Uh, I taught the July Crisis, for instance, for five years and never got a student to come in after class to talk about it. Never heard back from a student on it. Um, whatever I started playing out the July crisis as a, as a game and uh, st students were send sending me emails stopping me in the hallway for months and I still hear back from students about it they they remember they remember the game 
There is nobody in here who started playing in high school that does not have a library of those many of those games they played in their head. I think I'm a pretty decent military historian because I played war games when I was 13 years old. And when someone says oscillates, a map of oscillates pops into my head. Um, if somebody says, uh, I don't know, pick a battle. If I war game that battle, that map is still in my head. And I, and I could start thinking about it from that point on. Uh, we got, are you going to go out and study the literature? No. If you're going to write a PhD and find something great? No. If you're going to write a PhD on that topic, come join me and I'll, I'll, we'll enjoy each other's company until you sit such time, pick another topic to do your PhD dissertation on. And I'd like to jump in on this for a second too, uh, since this makes me nerd out. I uh, just thinking like literature is from Huizinga, Kawa, Sutton Smith, Turner, Perla, um, all kind of get into the same idea of the magic circle, presence, uh, synthetic experience, where what happens, to the, what the player experiences in that game, it becomes real psychologically to them. And Huizinga went as far as using the quote, the temple and the tennis court are indistinguishable. What it means is a well-designed and well-played game as a, as a rite of passage. It's like a religious experience. Hence why, going back to what Dr. Lacey said, you know, people can remember a well-played game 40 or 50 years after the fact, and they can't remember what they had for cereal the day before, because to them in their mind, it was a powerful uh, sensory moment. So yeah, games are, when done right, are extraordinarily powerful a means for teaching people information. They invest the ego. What did Benjamin Franklin say about a, uh, the prospect of a public hanging concentrates the mind wonderfully? Yeah. <laughs> there's, there's actually a lot of pedagogical research on uh, simulation-based and game-based uh, pedagogy in the context of a broader pedagogical model. But of course, uh, Jim is absolutely right that doing it in wargaming is yet immature. It, it take a pretty substantial research mm -hmm. design, some research um, uh, resourcing uh, to effectively uh, quantify some of the benefits, because you really have to have ex post facto uh, knowledge tests, and that's relatively hard to do. It's very, very difficult to test any non-objective uh, learning uh, requirement, even a Shakespearean literature course. Excellent. We have a quick. Oh, go ahead. I'm sorry, but knowledge, skills, and abilities are, are really hard to measure unless they are just uh, running a, a machine or some sort of uh, checklist of uh, simple uh, physical procedures. But understanding how to perceive and conceive, that's a very, very hard uh, ability set to quantify. We've got time for one more quick one. There was a question about uh, sort of post-World War I. Do you prefer topics or games that include U.S. troops? Uh, or do you, does that help the students understand uh, the context or, uh, or is it better to kind of keep them in a, in a domain that's not uh, as familiar to, the, to them? So I will jump in on my own class. So in my class, I try to make them specifically avoid conflicts they know pretty well from their own history or their own academic experience. Uh, partly this is because I want to widen their strategic and military history knowledge beyond like a handful of cases. Like, and we all know the ones we're talking about, like World War One, World War Two, Vietnam, like the greatest hits of American militarism uh, abroad. Uh, and I, so I try, so instead of just thinking about Afghanistan and Iraq as a counterinsurgency, uh, as your only counterinsurgency um, case studies, what about look at Algeria or Sri Lanka? And those are the ones I put on my course list as they uh, get to choose in terms of case studies. Um, and I think it, they do a lot of benefit for it because they get to see a different perspective of how the French approached uh, counterinsurgency or the Malay crisis, right, from the British perspective. Um, but also at the same time, I like to give them different perspectives on particular things in their uh, U.S. military history knowledge that they may have not remembered or never been taught or has was you know, uh, was taught poorly. So I think it's there's benefit to both. Uh, but I think I am of a proponent of a wider uh, gaming, but also case study approach towards you know, military history and military strategy. Excellent. 
Well, th we're right up on 2.30. It's been an hour, and in the interest of letting people get to the next uh, pr uh, presentations that are coming up, we'll have to close it out here. I want to thank my guests. Uh, and uh, you know, this is one of those uh, topics that, as, uh, as Dr. Lacey pointed out, people are always wanting to prove the value of these things. And, uh, you know, people who find that it works uh, for continue to use it. So to me, if it works, keep using it and take advantage of it. Over and out. Thank you very much. Thank you, everybody. And we're waving.